At a time of deep division in today's society, we must come together for humanity's sake. On Can We Talk 360, we strive to stimulate an authentic conversation on issues that affect all of us in an environment of tolerance. I am Eugene Pettis, attorney and community servant. Tune into our discussion to foster a greater awareness of yourself and others. Let's discover how there is strength in our differences and an abundance of possibilities when we stand together as one humanity. Welcome to Can We Talk 360. It is my honor to have with me today uh, Dr. Carl Mack. Dr. Carl Mack is really a jewel of this country, and, and I want to uh, introduce some of the uh, things that he's done. He's been a scholar. He's been a public servant in every city, every state, every region he's been in, and he's been an advocate. And in all of the things that are happening in our society today, particularly as it's uh, pertaining to Black history, you're going to see his face as one of the voices uh, that's going across this country stating why Black history is America's history, why it's essential, not just for people of color to know their history, but also for others to know the history and the contributions that African-Americans and people of color have made uh, in this country. Uh, Dr. Mack is a mechanical engineer. He's been a civil rights uh, activist. He's a lecturer. He's an author. Uh, he's really uh, been a Renaissance man when it comes to all the things he's done over the course of his life. He's uh, a graduate of Mississippi State University, uh, and a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. He's worked as an engineer for King County, for Metro Seattle, where he spent some time from 1987 to 2005 time frame. He's authored the book on Black Heritage Day, uh, one, two, three, and four. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit. He's also been the president of the Seattle King County branch of the NAACP. Uh, as well as Executive Director of National Society of Black Engineers from 2005 through 2013. He is a person who has been committed to the accuracy of history. And it's something that I think by the time you listen to this podcast and listen to his, his words, you'll understand why today it is so critical. We understand that in the state of Florida, but not just the state of Florida, across this country, there have been more and more attacks on black history. Uh, we need to know our history to understand the yes. subtlety of some of these attacks. Yes. Some of them are not as blatant. Some of them are bold and blatant, but there are right. some that are very subtle. And if you know the history you'll recognize this is a replay or a rerun, as they used to say, for TV shows. We've seen it before. And it's very important that all people understand Black history from whence we've come to understand that a lot of the games that are being played now are simply repeats for, th for things that worked before. But it's really important in my mind that we combat these efforts on the front end and not allow the legacy of our four parents who have fought, who have lost their lives to make sure we got beyond these chapters of history. It's very important that we don't allow through our complicity to slip back and then have to fight over again. It's easy to fight and keep your rights as it poses to lose them and get in the battle to try to get them back. So right. this is the first of many discussions we're going to have uh, uh, on this general topic. And I could not be happier than to have Dr. Carl Mack in this. In the state of Florida, we see just yesterday that, we see just on yesterday that uh, Do uh, Governor DeSantis, uh, through legislation that he has worked with the uh, conservative uh, House and the Senate, uh, banning books, books of black history. They banned a film in the state of Florida mm -hmm. curriculum on Ruby Bridges. Now, <laughs> what is it about that story that's so offensive? Well, they have given such a low bar 
uh, of if one parent, if one parent out of hundreds of thousands of students in some of these districts, if one parent says it's offensive, then uh, the book is removed or the film is removed from the curriculum. So that's how outrageous some of the things that are going. Uh, diversity and inclusion, taking that out of all universities and schools uh, that we can't talk about that. We can't spend dollars to make the playing field even. We can't continue to uh, advance the richness of bringing people together if we use the words diversity, inclusion, and equity. Those words are being banned by through legislative enactment, enactment through our governor uh, from the curriculums, not just of uh, grade schools, uh, K through 12, but banned at the level of university studies. When children, when people have grown from children to adults, uh, and the interesting thing that I want to put out there, and uh, uh, Dr. Mack, we're going to talk about this, is it's not the students that are saying, I don't want to see this. It's the parents who are stepping in. So with that introduction, um, I want to have a conversation with you, Carl, regarding the importance of why uh, we should be preserving our history and our heritage. Why, why is that important? Well, well, you know, Eugene, first of all, thank you so much for, for allowing me to be on. And, you know, when you think about history, history gives us the ability to think critically, to, be, to think critically about issues that are happening today. And without that history, without that knowledge, it's impossible to, to be at the forefront of having critical conversations about what you're seeing take place now. And so when you take a look at the study, the academia of our experience in this country, it is so overlooked. I remember, and I will say this to you, if I were to ask most black folks about the issue of slavery, was slavery a big part of our experience in this country? If I got a thousand black people, a thousand black people are going to say, oh, absolutely, yes. Oh, without question, slavery was a part. But if I ask those same people, tell me when did that institution end for our people in this country? What day did it end? Most of them would not know. Most of them would not know when we even came to this country. So I remember 2010, 2011, I was in Virginia, Jamestown, and they have a plaque commemorating the arrival of the first Blacks in August of 1619. And there were these two army generals there with me and they wanted to show me this plaque because they knew of my, you know, my appreciation for African-American history. And as I'm looking at this plaque, I look at the bottom line of this plaque and the bottom line said that the U.S. abolished slavery in 1863. And I'm looking at the generals like, look, man, I can appreciate that you guys want to show me this, but this plaque that was put up by the U.S. Department of Historic Resources, they got this thing wrong. So now you have to ask yourself, how did the Department of Historic Resources get it wrong? So when I get back to my office back in Alexandria, I now call the Department of Historic Resources and I say to them, that plaque that you have commemorating the first Blacks coming to America is wrong. And they say to me, Dr. Mack, what do you mean it's wrong? I said, the last line of that plaque says that the U.S. abolished slavery in 1863. Now, what that plaque is referring to is the Emancipation Proclamation, which Lincoln signed on January 1st, 1863. But as a student of history, we should all know that slavery ended on December 6th, 1865, but we'll go into that later. So when I told her that, they went back and looked at the plaque, and then they put up a new plaque. And on the new plaque they have, if you look at the bottom line, it says that the U.S. abolished slavery in 1865. So that is that is it. Now, most of us have heard of this. This we, we, We've coined the phrase hidden figures, and that's made pop popular uh, by Margot Lee Shutterly. So Margot Lee Shutterly uh, obviously wrote the book Hidden Figures, talking about, and so, but the question becomes, why did she name it Hidden Figures? Because these are people who have been hidden from history yet without the work of Katherine Johnson, per Neil Armstrong, I'm not getting in that space shuttle unless she, I'm not getting in that rocket unless she confirms the calculations. So because history has omitted these people, that's why Margot Lee Shutterly named her book Hidden Figures. So even when we take a look at Black History Month, even this year in February, I'm watching a press conference with Draymond Green, where Draymond Green says, I don't want 
February to be a Black History Month. I, we don't need a Black History Month. I heard the same thing uh, almost 15 years ago from uh, Morgan Freeman when he was on 60 Minutes, uttering the same thing. Why do we need a Black History Month? Do you have a history month? Do you have a Jewish history month? The mere fact that they say that, Eugene, implies that they do not know how February became Black History Month. How many times have I heard Black folks say, they gave us the coldest and shortest month out of the year, which implies that we don't even know how February became Black History Month. We think white folks gave it to us. So let us talk about how did February become Black History Month? So me, before, we, came, before we go into that, let me, let me stop you because you, 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 you mentioned uh, your conversation with the uh, uh, two gentlemen looking at the plaque that's on the screen. Right. Uh, and uh, told them that the history is wrong. It mm -hmm. notes 1619. Yes. And the mere reference of 1619 has somehow returned to be controversial in this country. Yes. yes. Uh, the I can't think of her name. What's the sister who, uh, uh, her name escapes me. And, and she, wrote, she wrote the book 1619 and has done the documentary 1619. Right. And it impacts her getting uh, uh, full professorship at her at her university, yeah. uh, and, not because of the fact that anything in the book was not factually correct. It's the topic. It's yes. bringing the history to light that somehow makes so many people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever said it was factually wrong, and nobody mm -hmm. brought anything to the table that proved that what she put in her book and documentary was wrong. But I, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to note the 1619 reference. And mm -hmm. from the first slide we showed to the second one, you see at the bottom what you informed the Department of Historic Resources of, and that is that the year that slavery was abolished was not 63, but it was in 65. Correct, and if correct. that organization or agency didn't have the history right, I think that uh, tells us how important it is for us to be uh, shepherds and voices of our accurate history. Because mm -hmm. in truth, most of us would have pa passed that plaque and not caught it. It's you and how you've studied history that and continue to teach history that allowed you to catch that and convince them to be accurate when they're mm -hmm. capturing the history of Africans coming to this country and African Americans throughout the course of our existence here. And, now, and, Gene, and, and Gene, to that point, that first that first plaque that was put up, when you say people have passed it, that plaque has been up since 1994. That, that's how long that plaque has been up, and yet nobody caught it, which again is why Dr. Woodson did what he did. And so for those who don't know Dr. Carter G. Woodson, he was born in 1875 in New Canton, Virginia. For the first 20 years of his life, he couldn't go to school. He had to stay at home and help support his family who had just come out of slavery. So from being self-taught, Dr. Woodson became in 1912, the first African-American who was a direct descendant of slaves to get a PhD. And he got that PhD from Harvard, right? And so Dr. Woodson understood as a student of history, what was going on with Hit the, the telling of America's story, American history. We were hidden figures. So what Dr. Woodson said, and he writes this in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro. He says, real education means to inspire people to live more abundantly, to begin with life as they find it, then to make it better. But the instructions thus far given most Negroes in colleges and universities that work to the contrary, in many cases, it increases the number of malcontents who offer no solutions to the problems about which they complain. So Dr. Woodson offered a solution. So in 1915, he started the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. In 1921, he started Associated Publishers. And these two organizations, they had four goals. One was to promote the writing and research of African-American history. Number two, to promote the publishing of quality Black information. And number three, to promote the study, which is what we're doing here. And then, Gene, you're doing it right now. And I can see in your office because the fourth thing he wanted us to do was to promote the collection. So if I were to walk in your office right now, right where you're sitting, and there was not one picture of you, just by looking at your walls, I would know this is the office of an African-American. Right. So he wanted us to promote the collection of black history. So in 1926, Dr. Woodson chose the second week in February for us as black folks to study these 
hidden figures that have been left out of American history. And at the time, they called it Negro History Week. The word Negro was replaced by the word Black, and it became Black History Week. And so, and the, and the, but the reason he chose the second week in February was in honor of two men, Abraham Lincoln, who was born February 12th, and Frederick Douglass, who was born February 14th. Now, Frederick Douglass did not know the exact date of his birthday, but when he was a child, his mother used to call him my little Valentine. So in honor of that, Frederick Douglass chose February 14th as his birthday. So that is why Dr. Woodson chose, in the words of our comedians, the coldest and shortest month out of the year. He chose the month of February in honor of these two men. And then in the mid seventies, what was started off as Negro History Week that evolved to Black History Week now made the evolution to being Black History Month. But the reason that Dr. Woodson wanted to do it is because American history eliminated us from it. We were hidden figures and we're still hidden figures, which is what DeSantis and others are doing. They want us to remain hidden. And had we stayed hidden, I would have walked past that 1994 plaque like everybody else and never knew the era of it. You know, in the, and I've heard the conversation about the shortest month of the year mm -hmm. uh, being selected as Black History Month. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was McDonald's that had a campaign for many years, Black History 365. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you say to folks that think history is just to be discussed and taught during February, Black History taught during February, uh, as opposed to every day teaching society in general and teaching our children and our, our citizens what Black history has contributed to this country and to the world? See, Gene, Ella Baker, the great civil rights activist, Ella Baker said, if I show you light, you will find the way. What Dr. Woodson did was showed us the light. He said, look, I need you to understand that you have a very rich and powerful history. Now that we got that history, let us study it every day. But then what are we doing? The fact that you and I are having a conversation right now about African-American history, and it ain't in the month of February, says that this is how we do it. But as long as none of us pick that mantle up, there's no need in criticizing the efforts of Dr. Woodson. He did his part. He gave us the foundation. Now, if all we do is leave it as a foundation and don't put a big, beautiful structure on it, that's not his fault. That is our fault. And so when we have gone through our, our schools, if we leave it to people like DeSantis, we would never, ever know anything about our experience in this country. And that is not Dr. Woodson's fault. That's not the month of February's fault. That's our fault, which is why, again, I'm so appreciative of what you're doing here. But there is no reason, because I guarantee you this, if you look at other cultures, they're not waiting for those, you know, they're not waiting for the teaching of their history inside of schools. They're doing it themselves. This took the words out of my mouth. I was I, I was going to touch upon that, Carl. Uh, I have a lot of Jewish bro brothers and sisters. Absolutely. Um, uh, they study their history. Yes. They Teach their history. They yes. send their children to Israel yes. free of charge. Yes, that, uh, that they know their history, and they're not looking to the state no. to teach it. Because the minute you rely on, as we used to say, the man, right, to teach your studies, they manipulate it. Right. And how do we, as a people, how do we get to the root of how we can control our own narrative? by teaching it from beginning of our children's lives throughout the course of their lives. Do you see, I guess the, the institution that we need to call upon is the church right. in the black community. How, how, do we, how do we start meeting that challenge so that we can be uh, the uh, purveyors of our history and stop relying on others? I think we should always check people that are misstating the history, but we should be out there communicating our history and our voices should be heard on that topic. How do we, how do we, uh, how I do agree. we, we start that process? Without question, we should be the griots of that history. So first we have to know. So to that point, I would tell you what, I, what, what has, what my calling, what I feel my calling is now. I've been asked to speak at a lot of colleges and universities, a lot of corporations around the country. Got paid a nice speaking fee for it. At this point in my life, 
I am willing to come to any institution, any church, anywhere, free of charge. All I'm asking you to do is to help with my expenses to get there. And I am going to, I am going to be that griot. I am going to be one of those teachers. But that is what we have to do. We have to now begin to say, let us start teaching our history. Let us be the griots of it. Let us take control of that. Because if we leave it in the hands of people like the state of Florida, Florida said that the teaching of black history violates Florida law. I mean, Gene, the, the, the other part that, that amazes me, with you being in the legal field, I'm trying to understand why the legal professions, although I do understand why they have not come up and filed a lawsuit against it. Because what has happened in, in our experience in this country, whenever something came towards us, in this case, affirmative action, the first thing they did was to now attack it legally. So here in the halls of academia, the state of Florida is saying, even in the sacred halls of academia, we do not want you to talk about that history. This is why Dr. Woodson did what he did. Because if we left it to their own devices and, 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 and free, uh, Morgan Freeman on 60 Minutes says, the best way to get over it is just not talk about it. If we never talked about our experience, do we think that somebody else is going to teach us? Now, speaking of Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass says this. Frederick Douglass says that any man who professes to favor freedom, but detest agitation as a man who wants crops without plowing the field. He wants rain, he wants the ocean without its awful roar. He wants rain without thunder and lightning. We must be thunder and lightning in protecting our culture and our history. And what is happening in Florida and all over the United States, it is time for us to, to, to go on the attack. We need to be on the offense of that because again, Dr. Woodson has done his job with the month of February. So any criticisms about February being Black History Month is absolutely rooted in ignorance. The, the uh, I, as you were speaking, and I've given this some thought previously, somehow we need to produce a method uh, to create a historical database Mm -hmm. uh, that can be tapped into, uh, that is readily available, uh, both speeches of historical figures, um, uh, information that can be called upon. And my thought, Carl, is to not just, it's, it's great to, I, I go to my church. I talked, I've been talking to various churches, but we can touch the individuals in that congregation. I'm looking to do it at a mass production level, for lack of a better word. I'm mm -hmm. looking to see what we can come up with to take one speech that you give and to be able to put that in a database that people can go into the libraries of their churches, into the libraries of the various divine nine Greek organizations uh, that we have and be taught the richness of that history, and it doesn't have to be in schools. It should be in our homes. It should be in our communities. Mm -hmm. We're able to bring all sorts of garbage into our homes through media. Why not find a way through some of the media sources that we have to bring this history in? And, and I see that as the challenge I see that as the, what we need to do as opposed to taking one church at a time because we'll be at that if we live to be 200 years old. Uh, we need to think of how can we get the Baptist Convention, for example, to take on the task of, of agreeing to disseminate this package of material through all of the churches that are represented in the convention, the Episcopal churches, all of the uh, various churches within uh, uh, their their assembly. So I, I think we need to be <laughs> taking this discussion to a bigger stage mm -hmm. to distribute it and disseminate it to more people. Uh, and that's something that I want you to think about and something I think we all need to think about. How can we do that most effective when uh, I, I, we cannot just rely on the schools to do it? Because even going back to my schooling up to 1978 when I graduated from high school. The books were very, very 
uh, depleted of our history. And since then, there has become more of it. And what are they doing now? They want to take it out again. They yes. want to, you know, they want to put Rosa Parks as not a black woman who took uh, a stance. They just want to say a woman took a stance. Right, right, correct, They're correct. Sanitizing the history in so many trivial but yet insulting ways. <laughs> we need to find out how we can have a a a a a a a, a, a treasure box, if you will, of of this history that uh, can be disseminated across the country uh, in an effective way. With, you know, Gene, I love the way you think. And so let me just say this to you. I have a conversation tomorrow with Dr. Jerry Young, who is the president of American Black Baptist. And my conversation is to do exactly what you just said. I've had a conversation already with Bishop Seawright of, of the AME Church. He's invited me to a conference of the AME Church gathering down in Birmingham in June of this year. So the very the the, the, the methodology that you just espoused is exactly what we're doing. But I also believe in the power of one. Right now, I have one man who took took an interest in me in regards to our history. His name is Dr. Edward Jones. And Dr. Edward Jones, I think about the number of people that I've been able to teach in regards to our history because of the power of one. So if it takes me personally going to one church at a time, that is the calling that I've been I've been called to do, and I will do it without complaint. So if it's one church at a time, so be it. If it's one podcast at a time, so be it. So again, I'm so grateful to you for opening up this opportunity and having a discussion. And, and you know, when you talk about this repository of our our history, what I need folks to understand is this. As much as I can appreciate the quintessential example of having one repository, we must understand that our history is worth the elbow grease of putting scholarship to it. So we got to dig and claw and find. And this is what I've been doing in my journey of trying to, to, to complete my education, because I think a holistic education has four components. You need the training that you get from schools and colleges and universities. You need a spiritual component to your training so that you understand that there's something bigger than you. You need a financial component to your education and you need a cultural component to that education. I'm now trying to help complete my holistic education every day by trying to get a little bit deeper into this study. Because I could tell you, Gene, that when I graduated from Mississippi State with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, I couldn't tell you 100 words about the Black experience in this country. Yeah, you know, and 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 I agree with you. I, I think we need to do it on dual tracks. I think we need yes. to do it one person at a time uh, because one person can touch the right person and who knows where it goes from there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I think that we need to look at our churches and I'm so happy to see that you were, we're thinking on the same line. Yes, yes. We need to look at our HBCUs. Yes. Uh, because they are so rich with our history oh, and the HBCUs can create a, a campaign, for lack of a better word, to have these students they have to give back this history into these communities in which they sit. Here in yes. Fort Lauderdale, we have we have uh, uh, Florida Memorial right here in South Florida. Shahab and the president is a, a, a great uh, man uh, who I happen to know, but to have those students as a part of their curriculum, you know, teaching it in some format that we don't allow the history to just be captured within the confines of that university, that we put it into the community, that we feel the obligation to put it in the community in ways that these kids, because I'm thinking early generations, you know, early years, are mm -hmm. proud of their history, know their history, and can therefore uh, be protectors of their history so they don't allow what has happened in decades and centuries past to revisit because of ignorance from whence we've come. But, but Gene, that ignorance is, see, that ignorance is, is playing out today. So, so let's take, you know, Juneteenth, for, for example, right? You know, they just made Juneteenth a national holiday. I want to say that the Senate did it in 2021. Now, what are your thoughts of Juneteenth being 
a national holiday? Well, you know, the the honest answer is that when they made it in uh, June 2021, I was happy that mm -hmm. it was it was recognized mm -hmm. um, uh with my limited knowledge on 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 the history of Juneteenth, uh, I, I I think that we were so pleased that it became a national holiday. I'll never forget, uh, you know, our former president Donald Trump uh, <laughs> said that you know he's the one that brought Juneteenth to life. He didn't know anything about Juneteenth uh, before the week somebody told him about it, but he, as always, took credit for doing that. Uh, but fortunately, the Senate. Uh, make that a national holiday. Uh, but I've come to learn through further study uh, that there is some errors in our ways of celebrating that date on June 19th. Tell us about it. Okay, so, so, so first of all, the question has to be, what is it about Juneteenth that makes it so special that it is worthy of a national holiday? Now, is Juneteenth a special day? Without question. Do I have a problem with Juneteenth? Not at all. But when you think about why they made it a national holiday, our vice president, the entire, and understand, the entire United States Senate voted unanimously to make Juneteenth a holiday. And they gave us their explanation because we wanted to commemorate a day to mark the end of America's original sin. Now, for those who don't know what America's original sin is, it is slavery. So what is it that made it special? There is nothing in Juneteenth that did not happen in your state, in the state of Florida on May 20th, 1865. There was, an, there was a brigadier general by the name of Edward McCook, I believe is, is his name, who stood on the floor of Knox House in Tallahassee. And I think that's where Knox House is, in Tallahassee. He stood on, on, on the steps there and he issued a proclamation thereby in accordance with Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, thereby proclaiming uh, all the blacks in the state of Florida to be free. On June 19, 1865, Gordon Granger wrote into Galveston, Texas, and he did the exact same thing. He issued a proclamation, General Order Number 3, in accordance with Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, but keep in mind at this point, Abraham Lincoln has been assassinated. So what is it that was so special about Juneteenth that made it worthy of a national holiday? They said, well, it represents the end of slavery. Okay. Those blacks in Galveston, in Florida, it was May 20th. In, in Texas, it was June 19th. So the blacks in Galveston, they were the last blacks enslaved. And then we heard the vice president of these United States, brilliant, beautiful Kamala Harris say, they, those in Galveston, they kept the information about their freedom away from them for two and a half years. And now, because of the lack of scholarship, 47 states have now designated Juneteenth as a state paid holiday. Do I have a problem with it? Yes, I have a problem with it because of scholarship. In the state of Florida, if you want to commemorate the end of slavery in the state of Florida, it is without question. There is no ambiguity about it. It should be May 20th. That should be the day. If it's in Texas, it should be June 19th. But if it is these United States, without question, it should be December 6th. So in order to understand that, we, we have to go through this history. Now, but, just stay with me. Uh, let's look at. I, I, I want to look at um, some of the. Is, is this time? That's, a, that's a beautiful date to start with. That's a beautiful place. Now, let us remember what happened on April twelfth, eighteen sixty-one. The Confederates. Now, but even before that, now remember, South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union. Then followed by with Mississippi. And, and ultimately, you had 11 Southern states to secede from the Union. But on April 12, 1861, they fired on Fort Sumner, and that started the Civil War. Now, without a scholarship of our history, when we were in schools, they said that the Civil War was fought over Northern aggression. It was fought over states' rights. Oh, no, no, no. 
All one has to do is look at the letter of secession from these states. You look at a speech. And for those who are looking, I want you to look up a speech by Alexander Stevens called the Cornerstone Speech. And in that speech, Alexander Stevens tells you why the Civil War was fought. But now, so the Civil War, to be very clear, the Civil War, if somebody asks you why was the Civil War fought, is one word and one word only. It was fought over slavery. Let, There's let no ambiguity. Let me bring There's, up uh, some of these 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 um, points to see if this aid you in your discussion. No, 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 no. What you got is fine right there. So, so I want okay. us to understand something. Okay, yeah, you you could you could even if you leave it, leave, take take it back to the map, Gene. That'll be perfect. If you okay. take it back to the map. So I want you to understand something. So when that Civil War was fought, now if yeah. you look at this, if you look at the states in red, you'll see West Virginia there. But what I need folks to remember is that when the Civil War started on April 12, 1861, Virginia was not Virginia was not a state. When Virginia seceded from the Union, there were 48 counties in the western part of the state that said, look, we are pro-slavery, but we are not pro-secession. So when Virginia seceded from the Union, those 48 counties applied for statehood, and then West Virginia became a state in 1863. So now it's important to go back to 1863, back to that January 1st, 1863. When Abraham Lincoln in, issued the Emancipation Proclamation, the Emancipation Proclamation said three things. Number one, it said for those who are enslaved in states that have left the Union, he's hereby proclaiming them to be free. The second thing that the Emancipation Proclamation did, it said, for those four states that did not leave the Union, Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, and Delaware, slavery is still legal. And that's important to this Juneteenth discussion. And then the third thing it did was it authorized Blacks to be able to fight in the Civil War. That's what the Emancipation Proclamation did. So now, when the Vice President said that they got the information two and a half years late, this is why that does not make sense, Gene. When those 11 states in gray, when they left the Union, they elected a Congress, they wrote a Confederate Constitution, they elected a president, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi, and they elected a vice president, Alexander Stevens of Georgia. So if you got yourself a Congress, you've written yourself a Constitution, you got a president and a vice president, those 11 states considered themselves their own nation. They did that in 1861. So if they did that in 1861, and then two years later, Lincoln says, I'm issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Those 11 states didn't care anything about that because as far as they was concerned, Lincoln had no jurisdiction over it. So now when you go back to Kamala Harris standing there, Vice President Harris standing there saying they got the word two and a half years late. Gene, let me just ask you, let's assume that they got the information on January 1st, 1863, which I am not surprised because they would have gotten it there. And I'm going to tell you why. There's a lot of people who have gone to church on December 31st. They call it watch night. The reason they call it Watch Night is because the very first Watch Night service occurred on December 31st, 1862, because our ancestors gathered in worship houses all across the nation, and we stayed up all night, quote unquote, watching to see if the next day, January 1st, 1863, Lincoln would actually sign the Emancipation Proclamation, which he did. So the very first Watch Night occurred on December 31st, 1862. All across the country, we knew. So even if our ancestors in Galveston, Texas, knew on January 1st, 1863, they weren't going anywhere because those Confederate states, they were their own nation. They didn't think Lincoln had any jurisdiction over them, which is why we had the war. So the idea that they got the information two and a half years late, nonsense. Now let's deal with they were the last Blacks enslaved. Remember I said that in the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln said, now go back, go back a slide. In that, Lincoln said this, for those states that did not leave the Union, slavery is still legal. So in Maryland, Missouri, Delaware, and Kentucky, slavery was still legal, and West Virginia, now that it became a state. But before the Civil War ended, the State Assembly of Maryland on November 1st, 1864, abolished slavery. On January 11th, 1865, Missouri abolished slavery. 
On February 3rd, 1865, before the Civil War ended, West Virginia abolished slavery. Now, there's two red states there that I don't have striped out. Those two states are Delaware and Kentucky. Delaware and Kentucky never abolished slavery. So when the Civil War ended on April 9th, 1865, it's over. For, for all intents and purposes, uh, uh, the surrender at Appomattox has taken place. Now, Granger goes into Galveston, Texas on June 19th, finds these Blacks still enslaved, and he issues General Order Number 3, proclaiming them to be free in accordance with Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. On June 20th, Gene, there were still 225,000 Black folks still enslaved in Kentucky and Delaware. So the idea that we're going to make Juneteenth a national holiday because number one, they got the word two and a half years late. We just showed you. It doesn't make sense. That's not true. Number two, they were the last blacks enslaved. No, they were not. Go and look up when did Delaware and Kentucky abolish slavery. They didn't have to worry about abolishing slavery because slavery was abolished with the passage of the 13th Amendment. Now we have to understand our civics class. In order for a proposal to become an amendment, two things have to happen. Number one, you need two thirds of the Congress to approve it. And number two, you need three fourths of the states in existence to ratify it. So on January 31st, 1865, two thirds of the Congress approved the proposal to abolish slavery in America. On December 6th, and, and at the time there were 36 states that made up the United States. Three-fourths of 36 is 27. On December 6th, 1865, Georgia became the 27th state to ratify the 13th Amendment. So for those of you who aren't quite sure, just look up when, did the 13, when was the 13th Amendment ratified, and you're going to find that it was December 6th, 1865. So if there is going to be a date per the United States Senate per the Vice President of the United States to commemorate the end of America's original sin, it is without doubt, it ain't June 19th, 1865. So the question is, do, if Black Lives Matter today, did they matter back then? Did they matter back then? So slavery ended in this country. If look at that timeline, January 31st, 1865, two thirds of the Congress approved the proposal. On April 9th, 1865, the Civil War ends. On June 19th, 1865, Granger goes into Galveston, Texas, Juneteenth. But between June 19th and December 6th, 225,000 Blacks are still enslaved in Delaware and Kentucky. They, not they don't get freed until December 6th, 1865, with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. That's what ended slavery. So because we don't know the scholarship, we sat there <clears throat> happy that they did it. Now, do I think there should be a national holiday to commemorate the end of slavery? Absolutely. But it is important for us to get our history right. Gene, I can't tell you that we're going to make a national holiday based on any other day other than your birthday. You can't go home to your wife on a day before or after your anniversary and say, honey, happy anniversary. You're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. It's important to get it right. You can't celebrate America's independence on July 3rd or June 3rd. You can't commemorate 9-11 on 9-10. America ain't having it. But you want to commemorate the end of America's original sin on June 19th when 225,000 of our ancestors were still enslaved? The only reason that happened is because we did not put scholarship to our experience in this country. We don't know our history. And, and, and the point you just made, uh, I think, needs to be amplified, uh, which is why it's even more important that we spend time knowing, getting to know our history, mm -hmm. because there was, a, there was a, a meeting and people said, let's do this. And mm -hmm. there was nobody in the room that knew the history. Right, so, that's right. So that's, so right. that's how it happened, as that's opposed right. to being a point of correction. Yes. It turned out to be perpetuation 
yes. of a of, of 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 a wrong date. Right. Uh, and 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 that's just example A of yes. why it's important to know and to study the history. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Gene, you know, now, now let, let's give an you know let, let's talk about another example of why we should understand our history. Now there's conversations around reparations, right? <laughs> so if you want to think that we have a dead history, and, and again, part of that example is in order for us to understand issues today, to think critically about issues today, we have to understand yesterday. And Gene, I can't think of a better topic to do that than reparations. So well, I don't know what you're talking about. talking about reparations, I mean, you know, you, you talked a little bit about the Confederate, you know, the Confederacy and and what was the purpose of the Confederacy uh, and, and, and which takes us into the conversation of reparations. You know, as kids are being taught, the Confederacy, uh, excuse me, the, 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 the Civil War was about, um, uh, they called it and termed it the lost cause. Yes, yes, uh, yes. And, 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 and again, you know, there's, there's also the propaganda that's been allowed, including all the statues that were uh, uh, raised around this country, and particularly uh, up north, uh, where some of these Confederate strongholds were, uh, mm -hmm. and down here in Florida. I mean, we yeah. have some of them in Florida as well. But yeah. take us through a history lesson, if you will, Carl, how this whole propaganda of the lost cause <laughs> takes us into a very um, uh, pertinent discussion of uh, uh, reparations. Okay. So, so first of all, let us understand what the idea, you know, what is the lost cause? And so it is an ideology that was pushed forth by Confederate veterans in trying to explain the Civil War. And so in the lost cause, they, they, it's several things that they said. They said, number one, the South was not, should not be blamed for starting the Civil War. The Civil War was fought over Northern aggression. And this was the South trying to protect its antebellum way of life. The lost cause says that those who were slave owners, they were benevolent people. They were good people. Number two, I mean, uh, number three or four is that the African-Americans who were enslaved, they were very happy. They had a job, they had shelter, and they were being fed. They were very happy. And the North came in and messed it up. This is the ideology around the lost cause. Now, you can think it foolish if you like, but go look at your history books. That's why, do they tell you in your history book, point blank, that the Civil War was fought over the issue of slavery? No, they do not. Now, on that screen, Gene, I don't know if people are going to be able to read what that document said, but this is a letter of secession from my state, the state of Mississippi. Now, I need for people to understand what the letter of secession is. I want you to go back and think about the Declaration of Independence. In very layman terms, the Declaration of Independence was just what it says. It was a document to declare our independence from England. But if you read the Declaration of Independence, the authors of that document say, we are going to list the reasons and we want this to be listed for a candid world to understand why we are declaring our independence from England. And so when you read the Declaration, you'll read, he has, he has, he has, he has. The he they're talking about is the King of England. So that's what the Declaration of Independence is. It is a document for the whole world to see why America had to declare its independence from England. Likewise, the letter of secession. The letter of secession written by the fathers of Mississippi said, let us tell you exactly why we're seceding from the union. So Gene, if you would do us a favor and read the opening lines to, to this letter of secession, and it'll, it'll, it'll paint the, the, the story that we're, we're about to get into, the lesson we're about to get into. In the momentous step which our state has taken of dissolving its connection with the government of which we so long formed a part, it is but just that we should declare 
the prominent reasons which have induced our cause, our course. Then it goes on to say, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of <laughs> slavery. That's right. The greatest material interest in the world, as they called it, mm -hmm. its labor supplies the product, which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of the commerce of the earth. Mm -hmm. These products are particular <laughs> to the climate verging on the tropical regions <laughs> and as by imperious law of nature none but the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun gee stop right there stop right there now folks i'm sorry but this is why the this is why they don't want you to understand history so gene in very layman's terms mississippi said <laughs> This is not a reason. This is the prominent reason that we have left the union. And they said that position is thoroughly identified with what, Gene? The, thoroughly. Inst the institution ahead. of slavery. Absolutely. Now, 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 the reason I find it funny is now they say it. When they said the, by the imperious laws of nature, what they're saying is that, that none but the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun. In layman's term, people, what they're saying is that God made the black man to come to Mississippi and to come in that South where it is hot. Nobody but the black man could come out there and pick that cotton. And God made us to pick that cotton. That's what they're saying. Now, Gene, if you could go to the... Now, this is where the conversation of reparations comes into place. Gene, if you could go to the next page, and there's a, there's a line that starts with the word utter subjugation. If you could yes. read that portion for us. <clears throat> Certainly. Uh, yes. Utter's subjugation awaits us in the Union if we should consent longer to remain in it. Mm -hmm. It is not a matter of choice, mm -hmm. but of necessity. Necessity. We must either submit to degradation and to the loss of property worth four billions of money. Stop right there, Gene. Now, here is my argument for reparations, people. Here is my argument. When you go to calculate the state of Mississippi, Gene, you didn't say. See, the state of Mississippi said very clearly. First of all, let us tell you, without any hesitation, any ambiguity, the reason we are leaving the union is over the institution of slavery. And now Mississippi said, and I need you to understand why we're, a, why we're willing to go to war, because this institution is worth $4 billion to the state of Mississippi. Family. In 1861, who knew what a billion dollars was? And yet Mississippi said that the free labor, free labor that our ancestors gave that state was worth $4 billion. See, that becomes my point of reparations. So let us see, one of the things people say is, well, how would you know how to calculate reparations? Okay. So when I was sitting in engineering class, engineering economy, uh, engineering economics to be more precise um, there was a formula that said if you want to know what somebody owes you in the future based on what you give them now and if you assume an interest rate you can calculate how much they would owe you in the future that formula goes something like this F is equal to P times 1 plus I raised to the N I is an assumed interest rate N that's the number of years and that's an exponent right so the P the present value is $4 billion. Tell you what, simple math, family. Take the interest rate for today, the inflation rate. Put the inflation rate on top of $4 billion and do that from 1861 to 2023. And when you think, oh my God, Carl, that's a big number. If that is your first thought, it's because you, have not, you do not understand the value and Mississippi is trying to tell you what the value of free labor was to the poorest state in the union, the state that if there's 50, we're 51. Mississippi said we were worth $4 billion. That's why the idea of reparations is a real deal. We have, because we don't have scholarship to our experience in this country, 
We do not understand the value that this country got from free labor for our ancestors for 244 years. We don't how understand that. that. How, how, you know, when you hear the reparations conversation and it's uh, uh, in many jurisdictions, many states, uh, mm -hmm. a, a hot topic, you know, you hear the response, Carl, that, well, I haven't done anything wrong, you know, in my lifetime. Why should I have to pay for it? Correct. And so and so understand this. There's a lot of things that we as Americans didn't do in our life, in our lifetime, but we still have to deal with it. Those are the laws of this country. Now, as it applies to, to America, the most sacred document in Gene, what would you consider the most important document in American history? Our Constitution. Constitution. So family, for those of you who are watching this podcast, here comes the other argument for reparations. I want you to look up Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution. <laughs> Article 1, Section 9 says this. The migration or importation of such persons, as any of the states now exist and shall think proper to admit, should not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808. But a tax or a duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. Now, Gene, here's my other question. Who is the only entity in this country that can collect the tax? The government. The United the States government. government. Gene, the government that was born with the, with the Constitution in 1788, is that same government still alive today in 2023? Absolutely. Absolutely. And see right here in the most important document in the history of this country, the Constitution of the United States, God is a good God all the time. Right there. See, that's the beautiful thing about the Constitution. It can never be erased. It can only be amended. So right there in Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, that piece is talking about the slave trade. And what America said to the 13 states, hey, 13 states. You can bring in as many slaves as you want to. See, they put the word migration on there to throw you off. But look who they taxed. They didn't tax migration. They only taxed importation because this piece is talking about the slave trade. So the American government said to the 13 states, bring in as many slaves as you want to. We can collect a tax of up to $10 for each one of them. And you can only do this for 20 years. And after 1808, there's no more importation of slaves. So see, you can calculate reparations based on what the government did. Now, when people want to talk about, I didn't do it. Okay, you didn't do it. Okay, I'm not coming to you to say what you did. But I am coming to this government to say what this government did. I am, is, is the state of, is the United States government is still alive. We are, we've established that. In the first argument, we talked about the state of Mississippi. Mississippi in 1861, is Mississippi still alive today? Yes. Are those 11 states that left the Union who benefited from slavery, are they still alive? Yes. Are those other five states that were slave states still alive? So in total, there are 16 slave states. So when you calculate reparations just based on Mississippi, now multiply that number times 16. And if that number seems too big for you, it only seems too big because you have no appreciation for 240. Gene, let me ask you this. How rich would you be if you had free labor for 244 years from millions of people? <laughs> yeah, and well, that, that, that raises the question. Uh, it kind of brings it in how what happened over that period of time where you, you, you see what happened on, on Black Wall Street. Yes, uh, yes. How, Successful Black Wall Street was, what if that turned in, which they had already proven their ability to have an extremely successful uh, business community? What if that had gone through generations? <laughs> so the, the wealth of the generations uh, would still be uh, being enjoyed today. Yes. Uh, with the absence of that, a lot of those uh, descendants from that time. Are, are, are improvised because of the yeah. fact that all of their family foundation was ripped away. Burned, now, Gene, 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 I, and Gene, I got to tell you. Now, the other part of reparations is 40 acres and a mule. We think about the 40 acres and a mule. 
while we are so we're still thinking about 40 acres family i want you to look this up too while you while you're doing your research i want you to look up may 20th 1862 the homestead act in the homestead act this country gave 160 acres of land to any peasant that 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 any white peasant that came to this country 160 acres of land per person and ultimately through the homestead act this country gave up 270 million acres of land 160 acres per we're still looking for 40 acres <laughs> now so to that point gene Tell me where you think we as a people, black folks, would be had when we we were free from bondage, that we now had 40 acres, let alone 160 acres. Because what we have to remember through scholarship, go back and put yourself on December 6, 1865. Carl, Gene, y'all's free now. Y'all can go and do whatever you want to. What, what are we free to, Gene? We ain't got no economic base. We have no foundation. What you and I just been free to, we were free to famine. That's what we were free to. We had no base to start. Yet those who came to this country, they gave them 160 acres of land to start their economic base. And for 244 years of chattel slavery, you free me and tell me to pull. I don't even have boots on and you telling me to pull myself up by my bootstraps. See, this level of thinking is what DeSantis, the state of Mississippi, this is what people are afraid of. This is the level of critical thinking that we must do. And, and, and Gene, again, I got to thank you so much for having such a, a conversation that, that gives us an opportunity to get inside the scholarship of our country just a little bit. And I wish that we had time to get inside the, the history of 40 Acres and a Mule, but we could save that conversation for another time. <laughs> I really appreciate, uh, Carl, uh, your scholarship and your willingness to listen to the call upon your life uh, yeah. to take the message uh, to all people, all people of all communities, all colors. This mm -hmm. won't be the last conversation. There's some other topics that we're going to follow up with and have you back on if your schedule so permits. So and Gene, I, if, you, if, if you don't mind, you know, you were asking me about this, the scholarship. So, so family, here, here's one thing, Gene, I, I'm not, I don't know if you know, but this is a Black History calendar that I did, but it's unlike any other Black History calendar. Every day of the year, there's somebody featured from Black History. And there's 366 pages. And a lot of what we've been talking about today is inside this calendar. So for any of you, find that? where can you find so that? You can find this on blackheritagedays.com. Blackheritagedays with an S.com. The cost of the calendar is $19.99 and it's free shipping. I wanted to make it extremely affordable. And the other thing about it is when you look at the calendar, there's no year. There's no day, no year. So it's a perpetual calendar. You can use it year after year after year. And so, but, but, and, and while we're doing this, I'm now also working on a Black History calendar similar to this, 366 days of all Black women. I got one that's dedicated to sports. And as we talk, I'm now working on one that's Blacks in science, technology, engineering, and math. It's all STEM, 366 days. So it's there that's for That's awesome. Uh, love you, my brother. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you for uh, coming on Can We Talk 360. The conversation will continue, but you've stimulated thoughts to those that are listening. Thank you so much. Thank you, my brother. The law firm of Hallitzer, Pettis & Schwamm is a proud sponsor of the Can We Talk 360 podcast. Our firm handles medical malpractice, wrongful death, catastrophic personal injury litigation, and workers' compensation matters. We pride ourselves in being advocates for justice on behalf of those who have been seriously injured. For decades, we've taken the lead in making your case our priority. It's who we are, it's who we'll always be. Hallitzer, Pettis, and Schwamm. Serious injuries, proven results. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Can We Talk 360? I sincerely hope that you were inspired to seize this moment in time and take real action towards change. Remember, all change begins with a conversation. Be sure to tune in every month for more fascinating discussions and motivational food for the soul. Please share with your friends, family, and colleagues. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Can We Talk 360 and visit us on the web at www.canwetalk360.com.